them. And, and very rarely do you find someone going in and going, this is really boring. Well, my children do that every now and again. But actually, uh, most people go into these amazing buildings and respond emotionally to them. And we're really keen to bind these buildings to the communities for the long term because they are local buildings, but they are of such importance to this country that we're very keen to make that happen. We don't know how COVID will affect historic places of worship. There are those that are very much of the view that more will close more quickly as a result of COVID, but there are those who, who think that that's not going to be the case. But we're here ready to help communities care for these buildings and keep them in local ownership, which I think is the right thing to do, and make sure that they're used and loved in a variety of different ways that are appropriate to these buildings. We've been hit this year and we've lost somewhere around £500,000 because our, our fundraising is predominantly aimed at local communities on the ground running events and that's not been able to happen and we don't know when those are going to be able to start up again. But we're very much geared towards what do we need to do and we're trying to hold the organisation together through this period because we feel there's going to be a great need for our skills and talents in the future. So please do consider joining the CCT. You can join and get a free book if you do, if you sign up by direct debit. And also, uh, please do, if you're already a member, uh, please don't feel uh, feel shy in giving more. Uh, that's absolutely fine. We have no problem. Uh, and any sum you want to give from a pound up to a million is absolutely fine. If you want to give over a million, that's also fine. Uh, we can find a way to accommodate that too. But actually, we do, uh, all levity aside, we do rely on your support and your help to keep us going. So thank you. And this lectures series, I hope, is some way of a sort of us giving back and sharing our passion for these fantastic buildings. Now, you're he not here to listen to me, you're, you're here to listen to John Cannon, a fantastic guy, a writer and architectural historian and a TV presenter, of course, and ne never forget he has a great practical guide on how to build a cathedral, which uh, is always an important thing to be able to do. And he also wrote a book to accompany that series called Cathedral. Uh, he's got a book on uh, medieval church architecture, which is published through Shire Books and the secret language of, secret, uh, of sacred spaces, um, decoding temples, mosques, churches, and other places of worship. He's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, a cathedral historian at Bristol Cathedral, and much in demand as a lecturer and a tour leader. Well, he's probably not doing so many tours at the moment, and we're very glad that he's given his time today for free to do a, 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 to do a lecture for us. Uh, we're definitely blessed by that. Um, I've known John for quite a long time, and so it's a real pleasure to see him because it's been a while since I've seen him. So um, over to you, John, and thank you again for your, your help of the Church's Conservation Trust. Thank you. Just bear with me a moment while I click things. Because uh, what I want to talk to you about today, and I'm assuming you can all hear me, yes, I can see me, so you must be able to hear me, is style, um, fashion, as one aspect, one extremely rewarding aspect of these wonderful buildings. To talk in his introduction about uh, excuse me, but people just talked in his introduction about how their, uh, in a sense, the tap root of any given community. I think the beauty of what we see when we go into them is one of the most vivid testaments to that. This is a capital, a bit of carving at the top of a column in uh, my local parish church nothing particularly special or exceptional about this building it's a small medieval church I think there are estimated to be at least 8,000 surviving medieval parish churches in this country and pretty much any one of them one can go into and see something like this exquisite work of art beautifully judged work of craftsmanship something that's partly rather witty. These curved bits here are called trumpet scallops and they turn for reasons that are uh, impossible to explain but which look lovely into something rather vegetal or plant-like. Something rather smart is going on here just in this little bit of decorative carving and of course the craftsmanship involved is equally astonishing. Not only do these little moments of beauty, well, they're the 
the most public and usually the finest works of art in any given community, um, they also tell a story because they're restless. The way motifs are depicted, tastes in how things should look, they keep changing uh, over the centuries of the medieval period and this great gathering of examples of uh, how one might decorate a bit of architecture then remains incredibly influential for all the centuries thereafter. So there's something rather interesting and curious about architectural style. Um, on the one hand, it's very superficial uh, and we don't have many medieval sources, for example, telling us about why things changed or what things might mean. And yet they're also uh, profoundly lovely and full of potential insight. It's very rare to go to a building and not see layering caused by additions and alterations made to the church over history. I've tried to prioritise parish churches in these slides and I've thrown in a few CECT examples, but uh, more than anything else, I, I try to put in pictures which I hope are nice to look at. Um, so if you want to go and see a parish church which embodies this sense of layering and change over time, um, I'm not going to do this place down by attempting to photograph it. Please go to Inglesham ACT Church in Wiltshire. Please don't all rush at once because it's one of the most wonderful places on the planet and it's very nice to be alone in. This layering is part of the quality, part of the personality of these buildings and one of the ways it's communicated is by uh, the changes in style um, as each mason keeps up with current practice over the centuries. They also give each building a personality and unique story which it's intellectually stimulating, stimulating to uh, unpick, uncover and understanding style helps one to do that. And then there's another aspect to them, which of course is, well, I'll be giving names to styles in the course of this lecture, but in the medieval period, each mason at any given time is simply working with what is up to date right now. Uh, as a result, for example, when you're looking at this, it's probably 1180 or 1190. This is the date uh, and as good as something you might see in a very metropolitan, very well-funded building. Uh, Miss Beckett died maybe a decade or so ago. Society is going through extraordinarily dramatic changes which help shape all of medieval uh, history from then on. In other words, style is kind of a time machine. To a, 500 years of, or even a thousand years of different versions of the present, the distant past. So these are all the things I want to, uh, I encourage you to hold in your mind as I talk about the style. It's also worth asking ourselves where this extraordinary architectural, decorative, aesthetic restlessness comes from. And I think we have to remember that in medieval culture, at every altar, uh, at least in theory, in every church in the land, a mass is said once a day. And almost everybody, mass is assumed to be a miraculous event. If your grief as an architect is to create something fitting for miracles, uh, it, one begins to be able to understand where this uh, constant creativity and rich ornamentation comes from. It's a sense of what is appropriate, this very charged, potentially sacral space. And one might kick around in the Bible for images that provide you some kind of inspiration. And then you might find that the Bible is surprisingly coy, not only about architecture, but specifically about heaven. Uh, there are certain texts, there are descriptions of the Temple of Jerusalem in the Old Testament. There's Christ's passing reference to uh, his father's house having many mansions. And then there's a rather psychedelic description in the book of Revelation of heaven as a city, vast, ordered, uh, glowing with supernatural light, made of precious stones uh, and adorned as a bride adorned for her husband. And these kinds of images 
provided fuel and perhaps the license for the story that I want to unfold. I'll be covering about a thousand years, say from five, six hundred ish AD to Reformation in the 16th century, but we'll be mostly in the last 500 years of that time, which is when the overwhelming majority of medieval bits and pieces in our parish churches date from. And it's worth bearing in mind throughout what I'm going to say that medieval culture has a very strong sense of hierarchy and is extremely literate visually. It reads images and forms uh, with extraordinary sophistication. These hierarchies are everywhere in the architecture. And one of the reasons why it's hard not to throw in things like this, uh, magnificent great churches, as we call them, because wherever we can establish dates, and it's usually in these buildings that we have dates, uh, it seems that this is where um, this is the crucible, the motifs and stylistic ideas that I'll be showing you. This is a building at the other extreme of this hierarchy. If these we can call great churches, perhaps we can call these lesser churches. Uh, this is about as simple as the Christian and sacred space can get. It's the basic DNA of a medieval parish church. Facing east, a separate space, the high altar, a space for congregation and procession, a bit of shelter on the way in and a kind of threshold, a tower, a vertical element containing bells, making the building more visible, more audible. Now, obviously, there are differences in funding and patronage between this and this. There is also a strong sense of visual hierarchy. Now, uh, like almost every slide in this presentation, I could bore about this for a long time, but we don't have the time. Uh, suffice to say that there are various architectural bangs and whistles which great churches have, and that parish churches, even when they're extremely well funded and sophisticated, don't have. In other words, they belong to this sense of visual hierarchy. And the exception that proves the rule is that there is only one building in England for sure, and arguably in Britain, uh, which was built as a parish church, which contains pretty much all the architectural things and whistles, a great church, and yet has never been a cathedral or a monastery or a collegiate foundation. Uh, and that is this building at Mary Redcliffe in Bristol. So that's a one in eight or nine thousand exception. Uh, it's smashed through some kind of invisible architectural glass ceiling. This implies that the sense of the shape of a building, the form of a building, matters in the medieval visual world as much as the detail of its style. And one kind of prove that looking at a castle like this, you know that this isn't a church without anybody having to tell you that's to do with the shape, form of the building. It's worth emphasizing that if you've digested medieval style, uh, the motifs that are in fashion are identical across all building types. So in a timber great hall of a mighty medieval lord, or in a merchant's house in a market town, you might see done in timber in buildings which look nothing like churches, exactly the motifs that I'll be talking to you about. There's another thing uh, we need to bear in mind, and which again, it would be lovely to talk about for a long time, uh, and that is, what we've lost. Now, I hope obviously uh, the Reformation and the hundreds of years that have taken place since mean that uh, vast numbers of artwork have gone, but it's also the matter of colour. These buildings are whitewashed and they're painted and really they'd have looked naked as bare stone. Here's the west front of Exeter Cathedral and it is now as it was intended to be. And these uh, tastes in polychromy, in wall painting and the decoration of stone, move roughly in phases which line up with the changing styles that I'll be talking about. So I indicated uh, earlier um, simplest kind of Christian sacred space. There are a variety of other forms that parish churches take. 
Misiform, for example. One model um, takes the form of almost all these buildings, and it goes back to the earliest ambitious Christian churches, uh, which were models on the basilica, modeled on the basilicas of ancient Rome, and which uh, appear quite suddenly um, under Constantine the Great in the early uh, 400s, the early 300s AD. These basilican churches have side aisles, rows of arches, a main central space, a clear story lighting that space, and the area where the main altar is is set aside spatially in some way. It applies here in Ravenna in the seventh century, sixth century, excuse me. It equally applies here in Oxfordshire in the 15th. Uh, style makes these two buildings very different, but the basic DNA of their form has an awful lot in common. Now, I have to excuse me, uh, like George, I'm, I've got a technical issue, which is that the last version of this presentation doesn't appear to have saved. So I want to start in the uh, Anglo-Saxon period before the conquest. I'm going to move quite quickly through this, partly for reasons of time, and partly because there's so little to go and see. There are uh, 400 odd years of Anglo-Saxon churches before there is anything surviving, uh, anything like the kinds of numbers or with scale of preservation where one can begin to talk about style. If you're in a church built before 10th century, something in the guidebook is going to tell you loud and clear because these are very, very rare things. That means I can move swiftly on to a period that starts, I guess, towards the uh, end of the 10th century, long 11th century, and runs right through 11th century uh, into the first decades after the conquest, when Anglo-Saxon architecture is relatively common. There's probably examples in most counties uh, when there are few monumental structures like this surviving, when there is absolutely emphatically a style being followed which is usually relatively small. Uh, moving from space to space is more like moving from room to room than moving around a huge unitary building. And ideas seem to be coming from two directions. One is the kind of mainstream of Carolingian and later European culture. The other is from a lost and probably very ambitious architecture in wood. So these baluster columns, really want you to imagine that they have literally been turned on a lathe. And here's an arch made to look like a triangle. And you can imagine how easy it would be to do this by just putting two planks together. These kinds of things are what I call diagnostic. See it in a church and you can be pretty confident that you're looking at a uh, work of the broadly of the 11th century. And it's these things that I want to talk about most uh, in this lecture dynamic graphic patterns made of thin strips of stone called Durster strips and where it's very emphatic this sequence on the corner vertical horizontal uh, lump of stone. <laughs> this is a bit harder to describe but I just need to throw it in. Uh, a lot of carved detailing like capitals and things can look rather primitive though I think if one looks at Anglo-Saxon church furnishings and decorations, it's clear that it's not as simple as that. They, people can certainly do exquisite refinement. It must be part of the effect they want to achieve. Nevertheless, this sort of rather hard to define effect that looks as if um, a five-year-old had done art deco with plasticine uh, is, is kind of uh, recognizable once one gets to know it. Well, that's uh, a whole culture um, dispensed with in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the reasons for dealing with it so briefly is really what came next. Uh, a change sweeps across architecture in Europe in the 11th, 12th centuries, uh, which brings it to a whole new level of achievement. It's really the first time that Western Europe has an architecture which is equal to that of the East or of ancient Rome. It is also distinct, absolutely fundamentally distinct from it. And we call this very pan-European style Romanesque. And in England, it's understandably called Norman because uh, it has a remarkable early phase, almost entirely focused in the 30 or 40 years after the conquest 
uh, when almost all the greater churches of England, particularly the cathedral, were rebuilt on a colossal scale. Now, you won't see this much in parish churches, but it's, uh, it forms the kind of underpinning for the phase of Romanesque, which you will see a lot of in parish churches. Just notice uh, how unitary how these buildings are rendered as unitary spaces by their use of bays, repeated compositions, and enormous arches allowing one to glimpse subsidiary spaces, etc. This phase of Romanesque is almost brutalist sometimes. Uh, its impact, uh, and in particular, it likes to count altar spaces or important altar spaces with curved spaces known as apses. Now what happens in the 12th century, which is really what I want to talk mostly about, is that this basic building block of style comes rapidly, extremely varied, extremely richly ornamented, and sort of lighter and lighter on its feet. So that heaviness disappears. And it's at this period that parish churches in England were rebuilt or even built anew in quite enormous numbers. And it's very common to go into a parish church and see some work 12th century. Uh, and things like fonts and doorways are particularly frequently encountered. It's much rarer to see something uh, entire and altered uh, and existence of a medieval app like here at Kilpeck is one clue uh, where a large chunk of the building might remain in the 12th century. Windows are simple, semi-semicular arch at the top uh, and often with diagnostic features of this phase of architecture um, around them. Uh, and it's these that are so easy to recognize and that I want to focus on. Quick shout out for the vault. Uh, if this was electron cathedrals, we could talk for England about vaults. Uh, in parish churches, well, they're one of the things that parish churches rarely have. Uh, and if there is a vaulted space, it'll be the chancel, perhaps the porch or the tower, but it won't be a couple, literally a couple of exceptions, the whole church. The vault is an indication of the new ambition of Romanesque. Uh, Romanesque invents what you can see here, the rib vault, which is a technical innovation from which all the rest of architecture in the medieval period unfurls. And really what I'm trying to say is that all of medieval architecture really unfurls from the achievements of Romanesque. Simple cylindrical columns where they're relatively fat or look like half masts attached to a wall something to look out for. And this is uh, an early Romanesque great church thing called a cushion capital. It's a form I'd like you to just uh, digest because it, it does two things. Partly it's very geometrical, it's very abstract in form, and partly it wants you to understand that what's above it is heavy. It's kind of pressing it downwards like a muscle. And that's just the cushion capital isn't something you're going to see much in parish churches, but it's crucial for understanding what happens as Romanesque becomes richly ornamented in the 12th century. You can subdivide the cushion into little separate features called scallops. Then you might be tempted to add ornament to them. This is what you'll see in parish churches. Scallops with car decorative carving on. Look at here at the wonderful church in Italy in Oxfordshire or go to the CCT, CCT's amazing All Saints in Northampton and see Things which are basically cushion capitals somewhere under the surface, so lavishly ornamented that the uh, basic abstract form um, is more, uh, it, it's something almost intu intuitively aware of rather than seeing clearly. So be aware of this shape of the cushion capital and then look out for these elaborations on it. You're in the 12th century and the world of the parish church. And there are some almost nightmarish variety of other decorative motifs which appear in the course of the 12th century filtering out from the great churches. Uh, and many of these are quite well known. The chevron or zigzag, probably the single most diagnostic and common feature of architecture of this period. And then a host of other slightly more abstruse things. Uh, firstly, chevron can be done, is done with greater and greater creativity as the 12th century goes on. And then there are things like this, which I guess are chevrons turn into animals. Uh, they're called heads, and one can have huge amounts of fun and maybe the odd nightmare imagining what they might do to you. 
These again are literally diagnostic. If you see this stuff, you know you're in the 12th century. The variety of ornamentation at this time is interesting too. There's a lot going on in people's heads. And among the things that are going on, uh, the germination of something new. And something new actually starts quite suddenly uh, with a series of revolutionary developments in the Ile de France. It uses pointed arches, and it's aiming for weightlessness, kind of skeletal correct quality as if there are no windows there at all. And in France, at least, there's a clear consensus about, you know, that's our aim, uh, and each building outdoes its predecessor within a Romanesque mainstream, but clearly going in a new direction, which we now call Gothic. Romanesque crosses the channel very early. England is really the only place which gets Gothic for 100 years or so. Uh, it's different on this side of the channel. It's more layered, more lavish, more charged with meaning. Now, this phase during which Gothic is emerging within Romanesque, you can occasionally pick up in parish churches. If you see a pointed arch and a semicircular arch combined in one composition, that's a clue. And there is one motif among the panoply of motifs that come and go at this time, which is again diagnostic. And this is this capital type here called the water leaf. Remember our ocean capital, weight pushing down, abstract. This is the opposite. Um, here's some water leaf in a CCT church in North Lincolnshire. It melts, wants you to think that the arch above it is weightless. It wants you to think it's something vegetal, something growing, rather than something simply sculptural and abstract. And that really embodies the kind of effect that people who are pushing in this thick direction within Romanesque want to achieve. So this appears around, I guess, the 1150s or 1160s and disappears by around 1190 or 1200 uh, as maybe the only absolutely diagnostic motif, what's often called the transitional style or early Gothic. It's really experimental. It's varied. People are trying lots of different things with um, basic common aim. And around 1200, there is, you'll forgive the expression, a kind of lockdown. Uh, there's a consensus about Gothic, about the pointed arch. And huge numbers of motifs are just thrown out of the window. And instead, there's a rather narrow rule book of how to do architecture. And we call this early English. Pointed arches are everywhere. Uh, the style is rather linear, full of effects of light and shade, rather restrained, um, depending on proportion and elegance in a way that's uh, quite unusual in the medieval period. Some buildings like the turn in Wiltz are almost as plain and logical as a nonconformist chapel. Although the pointed arch is standard, and on here you can see what we call an equilateral arch, which is the default form of pointed arch throughout the medieval period, there are certain diagnostic arch forms which come and go with our stylistic phases, and the left of my equilateral arch here is one of them, lancet arch, extremely high and thin. It's like uh, if you fell on it, it would do you a bit of mischief. Here's a not very well photographed example. Parish church. Confusingly, this kind of window is called a lancet window, even if it doesn't have a lancet arch at the top of it. It's just a single, relatively large, compared to Romanesque windows, light with a pointed top of the pointed top. I mean, there's nothing else there, no bits of cusping, no bits of stonework within the opening. You can be pretty confident that you're somewhere between 1190 ish and 1240 ish in the early English style. These were arranged in noble uh, sequences, uh, all about proportion and elegance. Triplets like this, stepped lancets, they're called, uh, are very common. There must be hundreds around the country. Occasionally, we get extras, uh, increase number. Something happens within this. The arrangement of windows uh, into patterns called um, plate tracery. The germination of an idea which, starting in France around 1210 and coming to England around 1240, turns into bar tracery. 
in which one can insert very delicate patterns within a single arch. This is a crucial innovation for the style, stylistic phases are to come. Now, we can argue afterwards about whether early English stopped with the invention of bar tracery. Uh, I would argue that it doesn't. But, um, that's one park, you know, you'll get heated about these things, I understand. Uh, if you see simple bar tracery, you can be confident you are later, your 40s, 1250s, 1260s. I'll, we'll just park that there and carry on, looking at a few more agnostic aspects of early English. So those lancet windows are one, these very thin drain pipe like columns, often with little clasping features on them, are another. Here's some step tracery, step lancets with these things, often done in a separate polished stone uh, in some of the posher buildings. And then the capitals, which go at the top of these things, well, they have a kind of fantasy genus. There is just one way of carving foliage. Uh, it's a bit like a fleur de lis. Three lobed leaves, or sometimes five lobed leaves, some with a very pronounced central leaf and a big stamen plunging into it. It really is like a genus. You know, you really could do a botanical illustration of it. And there must be thousands and thousands of sprigs of stiff leaf doing all kinds of imaginative things on capitals around the country. And if you see them, you know you're somewhere between the 1190s, 1200s, and the 1250s, uh, well, perhaps the 1260s. It's very, very diagnostic. It's clearly right for whatever effect we want to achieve at this date. There are other things too. Here's the rather painful thing known as dog tooth. Here's a sort of cutaway version of it, like little pyramids or stiff little four petal flowers called nail head. Then, if you see these, same dating and stiff leafed. Towards the end of early English, ornamentation is knocking on the door and uh, the discipline of early English starts to fall away. And somewhere we have to decide, say, a new style is born. Now, this new style is very varied, uh, very, very restless, sometimes almost avant-garde, and we call it decorated. As I said earlier, quite where we place the dividing line uh, is a matter of opinion. I hope you can see a step change uh, between what I've been showing you, in particular, this window tracery pattern here, and this, which is a classic work of the decorated period. Decorated is almost Baroque in spirit. It loves ornament, it loves to blur the boundaries between what's architecture, what's sculpture, indeed what is metalwork, what is stained glass, what is a manuscript illumination, intensely creative. People like me get slightly overexcited about it and I'll try not to do that now uh, or it'll go badly over time. In particular, I mean, Decorated is starting around 1270s, 1260s maybe, uh, it has a second phase, a new um, flood of ideas coming in around 1300. And that's what I want to focus on today because that's where the most easy to diagnose and common motifs can be seen. The underlying idea of sense around ornamentation again starts in France, comes to England with high profile project of the mid 13th century. The motifs, the details of how you do plants, what patterns you put in windows, you don't change till the 1270s. You need to give a shout out for what I call the Shakespeare moment, uh, sometimes seen in parish churches, uh, but more usually seen in great churches, a series of almost uh, one-off architectural experiments in the 1320s and 1330s, which for me are among uh, the most breathtaking moments in architectural history, anywhere and any time. And after 1300, when these diagnostic features I want to particularly talk about come in, the new kind of arch, this S-shaped thing here, counterintuitive, couldn't hold anything much up, curvaceous, organic, very much in the spirit of the decorated style, and it's called the OG. So here's an OG arch, lavishly carved as is typical of the style, probably held a tomb at Buckington in Oxford. Yeah. Here are more OGs at St Mary Redcliffe in Bristol, 
nodding outwards. These are nodding OGs. And we'll see more of these as we go through the period. So early on, before there are OGs, we just get a huge variety uh, of patterns in window tracery. But once the OG curve appears, after about 1300, it changes everything and these flickering uh, interpenetrating flamboyant curvilinear lines appear. And this phase of decorated is uh, sometimes called curvilinear. It's particularly common in Eastern England. And there's one particular type of tracery, this little motif here, um, which can be just tessellated outwards and repeated Wherever you see it, you can be confident you're in maybe 1320 or 1330. Uh, this reticulated tracery is very common and very diagnostic. Foliage changes too. Stiff life ossifies or fossilizes into something rather more crinkly and seaweed like. Uh, that actually remains a kind of default way of doing foliage for the rest of the medieval period, but it's a decade decorated invention and if the other motifs around it are also decorated you can say you're in a decorated building and well, you're certainly between say 1270 and 1350 or 60 and if there are OG curves and things around then you're after 1300 or 1310. Here's another one of these lovely things that seems to have been invented specifically so that architectural historians can beat things in future centuries called the ball flower and like the stiff leaf, it's a fantasy genus. It's always the same, this ball containing another little ball inside it. It serves to break down one's sense of the clarity of a building. Uh, sometimes it looks as if the church itself has caught a rash uh, and it's very much in the um, inclusive, restless, witty spirit of this style, which likes to create what we call micro-architectural fantasies, uh, works of fittings which are almost works of architectural sculpture uh, or architectural design. And it won't be surprising to hear that this is the period when that wonderful aspect of medieval art, the marginal image, the gargoyles, the mermaids, the green men, uh, the absolute height of artistic achievement. And something happened. And starts in the 1330s and as ever it starts with some very high profile buildings associated with the court and when it began it probably just felt like a, another brilliant experiment. Um, in Westminster you can see lines of a window running down over the wall and then running again over the window beneath. Here at Gloucester you can see the same idea forming almost a grid and I hope you can see that each element of this grid is in effect light of a window, a single bit of a window uh, repeated over a wall. This, it turns out, was the potential DNA of a new way of doing architecture. And it spreads over England in the second half of the 14th century. And we call it perpendicular. Now, the question of how medieval architecture and medieval culture might line up with each other uh, is another huge one, but it's remarkable that the takeover of perpendicular happens really after the Black Death uh, and lines up very neatly with a phase of medieval culture called late medieval. Uh, where it's very distinctive um, phrase, many of which will lead into the modern world, uh, and others which are very relevant simply to understanding that period for what it was, appeared to uh, an intense flowering of the um, religious practices. And vast numbers of churches are rebuilt at this time. It's not at all rare to see an entirely perpendicular church and very rare to see a church without any perpendicular in it. Perpendicular is rather sober compared to decorated, uh, sometimes almost rather masculine. Uh, it's rather conservative, unlike decorated or indeed Romanesque, stands still for decades and decades, and it's also uniquely English. Other European countries have got Gothic at this point, and they tend to have their own national styles, national take on Gothic, uh, and certainly perpendicular, well, it's everywhere in England, it's common in Wales, there are sometimes hints of it in Scotland, but it's pretty rare even there and outside 
and you, you, know, you do not see it uh, outside the British Isle. It's quite easy to recognise. I hope you can see this panel idea repeating across the windows and across the walls. I hope you can see that this porch, if you drew it as an elevation, would almost be a grid, albeit with little arches and cusps separating the elements. The panel is the E equals MC squared, both perpendicular. Everything flows out from that sing simple idea. Here you can see it inside a grand merchant funded parish church. Here are two panels side by side on a boom chest. Here are some panels in a kind of tippy toes with the ones below them on an arch. It's everywhere. In general, as we call it, wants to flatten, uh, reduce the archiness of architecture and it invents a further kind of arch, a Tudor or four centered arch, which is about as flat as an arch can be and still be an arch. Here's a four centered arch uh, supporting the vault in one of the most numinous spaces I know, wonderful crypt at St. John's, the CC Church, uh, CCT Church in Boston. And here are four centered arches making arcades in two parish churches. And often we see these things clasped in square frames around walls and arches. Very easy to recognize this style. Window tracery, well, you know, remember articulations of decorated, imagine applying a ruler to them uh, and you get a basic idea of perpendicular tracery, which can be quite repetitive. There are certain window patterns like these here, which must appear hundreds, perhaps thousands of times uh, in the parish churches of England. Look out for transoms, very emphatic horizontal motifs, again, right angles, straight lines. Look out for vertical elements which run all the way from the base of the window to the very top of the arch. You won't see that in any previous phase of architectural taste. Look out for windows that have square tops. I think you're beginning to get the idea. Right angles, straight lines. And very occasionally you might see one of these a fan vault, which is really the answer to the problem. How do I apply the idea of the panel and the grid to a curved ceiling? And these, although they're invented in the West Country in the 14th century, only become widespread very, very late in perpendicular when it suddenly finds a new uh, um, depth of creativity and inventiveness, uh, roughly at the time that the Tudors came to power. You might see little things hanging down, like this little pendant here, ultimately inspired by these extraordinary pendants uh, in the Lady Chapel, in the Seventh Chapel at Westminster Abbey. Capitals are often polygons at the top and rather small. Again, straight lines. And often you see bands of foliage, again, emphasizing uh, horizontality. Churches were hugely enriched at this time and partly for that reason, partly because it's the most recent phase, the one from which things are most likely to survive, there are lots of perpendicular screens and fittings and fonts and often they're carved with these very emphatic horizontal band, particularly this S pattern um, with foliage alternating top and bottom. You see it again and again. And there are certain specific motifs, angels holding um, all kinds of unique to perpendicular images, the instruments of the passion, uh, uh, the coats of arms of the death of Christ, if you like, uh, nails, lances, crosses, uh, just one example. And then right at the end, in the 16th century, images are coming across the channel uh, in printed books of engravings uh, that reflect Renaissance ideas. And if you see these kinds of arabesques and grotesques, uh, you know you're in the very last throes, not only of perpendicular, but of medieval style, medieval taste. Uh, Reformation is happening as these things are being created and with architecture and religion uh, and society heading off in a new direction. Perpendicular has uh, very strong regional styles. Uh, in East Anglia, we have this wonderful art called flushwork, flint and limestone making buttons. 
in the far west, there's a very distinctive granite vernacular, uh, and there are others. It's extraordinary juggernaut at 500, 1,000 years of creativity comes to a juddering halt or perhaps a huge redirection with the Reformation. Now, the Reformation is a complex process. The main thing to emphasize, I think, is A, I hope it doesn't even mean worth me saying, the scale of destruction. B, well, surprising how much also survives. There are some remarkable survivors. C, its main aim is to get rid of uh, sacred images, religious images, things that could be called idols. So I don't think there is a single rude a carving of Christ on the cross above the chancel arch or in the chancel arch, of which there must have been tens of thousands in this country. Not a single one survives whole. But the other extreme things that aren't religious, like uh, tombs, um, gargoyles, there are lots of those. Finally, just a very brief note. Uh, these various styles don't die. You saw in the introductory lecture how there are uh, versions of perpendicular and other styles inspiring architecture for centuries afterwards. And of course, the Victorians fell in love with Gothic and staged a Gothic revival, which could result in buildings which in terms of style, like this one, are absolutely perfect versions of perpendicular, and yet in terms of form, never be mistaken for a church. Distinguishing Victorian recarvings of medieval, which is what this is, from the real McCoy uh, is a whole uh, minefield of its own. It's certainly something to be aware of as one moves around parish churches and indulges in the huge aesthetic, intellectual, and dare I say it, sometimes even spiritual pleasure of watching style change from single, simple window with a Romanesque top to a single simple window, an early English top, one has gone all decorated in the 14th century, and then the perpendicular equivalent, square top, emphatic hood mold. You can't get simpler than one window, and yet each of these is a time machine, if you like, to a particular moment of the distant past, the tastes that governed it. If you want to be able to carry something around and look at churches and identify these styles, uh, I do recommend my own book, which I believe is available on the CCT website. Uh, you can certainly place orders for it there. Thank you. John, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And there's been some really great comments coming in today. It's wonderful to see such an engaging um, or engaged audience um, with one of our lectures. Um, everyone, I am so sorry that we ran over schedule today. Um, it's, uh, as I said at the start, um, I, my MacBook um, totally decided to have a wobbly. And um, so I had to manually reboot. So I'm very sorry for that and why we've run over schedule today. As John said, though, he has got a book. I have it here. Um, it's like this bit. Here's one I made earlier, but I know um, it's a really is a great book. Um, everyone, we are working at the moment with the publisher of these books. Keep an eye on our website because um, we. I've just heard from them today, and um, sadly, this book um, they've run out of. They're getting some more though. Um, so do have a look on our website, but we'll be commenting away once they are available. We'll let you know. We are trying to make them cheaper than a certain well-known retailer, and that is online. So. Um, do try and buy them from us because the profits from these go directly to conserving historic churches. Absolutely. Um, there's been loads of questions coming in. So um, I'm going to dive into those in just a moment. If I don't have time to answer, ask all your questions, everyone. And what I'll do is I'll send John a message and hopefully you can write back to you. But I'm going to dive into questions. Um, we today we've posted details of further lectures so we put our series online. So do go on our Facebook events page and have a look at upcoming talks. I know um, there's been quite a few comments about the sound and the connection. We are working on a new bit of software. We'll be leaving, at the moment, this is all run through Zoom onto Facebook. We're leaving Zoom, um, you'll, um, you'll be pleased to know. We're going onto a new platform, Vimeo, um, and we've already started testing. So we've got our new cameras here that we're all testing out this week. I've been quite busy checking stuff. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll be on the new platform and that will sort out a lot of the technical problems that a lot of you have flagged with us. So uh, bear with us while we sort out on that. So without further ado, I'm going to dive straight into some questions. There's been a lot coming in. So thank you ever so much, everyone. So for the first question, 
Lincoln Cathedral was fortified like the castle next door. Were the churches designed to be fortresses of last resort deliberately? I think there are places where we can say that uh, did happen. Some of the uh, church towers um, are clearly very close to the hill towers, the um, fortified homes of that part of the country. But, um, as far as I can see, it's, that's relatively rare. Usually it's more symbolic, as is the case with Lincoln, although it was used defensively. Um, intention there is at least as much symbolic as actually defensive. So I, I personally wouldn't see it as a major concern. I guess church towers um, were aware that this could be a place of last resort. I wouldn't say it's a major guiding feature except in exceptional circumstances. Thanks, John, for that. And uh, our second question, um, we look when we talk about some of the Anglo-Saxon church architecture, mm. some say, was that vista strips of Anglo-Saxon design, was it that you shoe? Uh, yes, I was showing, they're called um, pilaster strips, and they really look like bits of wood, like half timbering done in wood, and arranged in very kind of dynamic graphic patterns. Thank you, John. And going back, um, and I, uh, uh, I think it's quite an interesting question what they've asked and um, I know we commented we're actually working on some pre-film series everyone um, that we're hoping to launch later on this year so do keep your eyes deep peeled for that but um, do you have any thoughts on churches being built on pagan sites was it an intentional decision? Oh my goodness um, there are clearly places where that happens uh, I think the big issue is that there are pagans in England in the 5th, 6th, 7th century, uh, but not many churches, um, and the vast number of churches, as far as we can say, um, are being built at a period when most people think of themselves as Christian, if not everybody thinks of themselves as Christian, and the centuries of change between that. So um, it's actually, it seems to me that there are often continuities in places that people feel are special and which are uh, bits of their place, their landscape that matter to them. But being able to pin down and say this is definitely consciously put in a place that was once colored by pagans, it, it often seems like it's the case and it often falls apart when you look more closely. It does happen. Um, so again, it's, it's not a simple matter. Thanks, John. And um, you've shown some wonderful images of decorative stonework and some wonderful carving and someone's picked up and said um can they ask a question about who would have actually created this stonework would they have been local craftsmen or were these stone people did they travel across the country did they only work on parish church did they were these people who built the cathedrals too this is one of those um uh i'm glad you've asked that we've got all day haven't we questions um <laughs> I'd be worth plugging my course on cathedral architecture at um, Oxford. Uh, it's an online course and a lot of this detail is covered there. Um, basically, these people are to some extent professional masons. They may not do it literally full time, though many of them do. Um, and they'll often get their ideas from, from full time lodgers working in the bigger projects, the great churches and cathedrals and abbeys where work goes on for decades and people come in, learn skills and go back to villages and towns. But, some extent or another, they will um, be, have suitable expertise and experience and will be part-time or full-time masons. And actually, although these carvings look incredibly varied to us, they do have an underlying language, a grammar uh, in common, and not just sort of let's make up something crazy. Um, it almost makes them more interesting and remarkable. Thanks, John. And thanks for the question. That's re that was a really good one. And we're, we'll try and get John yeah. back also and do some more lectures and some more detailed stuff on some other points. But um, we've gone on to um, perpendicular um, architecture here, John. We've had a question come in saying, is the perpendicular style more prevalent in areas which accumulated wealth? Um, for example, the wool trade. Um, is it more prevalent? Not sure. <laughs> Are the churches bigger and grander and... In other words, is it more common to see entire churches rebuilt in quite a well-funded way at that period? Yes, uh, I think that's emphatically the case. And you can actually have quite a lot of fun uh, working out whether or not there's a trickle down going on because, well, for example, in the Cotswolds, you go up the Cotswold valleys and there are strings of tiny little churches which may have a perpendicular window or a perpendicular tower, and then go to the local market town, North Leach, Cirencester, 
Fairford, and there you'll see the local merchants putting huge money into entirely rebuilt parish churches. Um, so, simple answer is yes. The question had a yes or no answer. <laughs> Thanks. And um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions here. Um, someone's asked about gargoyles, mm -hmm. and they said, where do gargoyles fit into all of the chronology? Um, can they be used for dating a parish church? Um, along with so much else, uh, what we call marginalia, this amazing grammar of grotesques and gargoyles and horrible heads, uh, is an invention of the Romanesque. Um, to be able to exist thereafter, so you can see it in churches of any period, there are certain things, I think I mentioned things like uh, the instruments of the passion, um, which do line up chronologically. You only get those in perpendicular buildings by and large. Um, elsewhere, it's more a matter of getting to know the way style changes, uh, the way figures are depicted. Um, you can do that and then you can date things, but it isn't uh, a simple, as a diagnostic motif. And as I said before, certain styles make more of this business than others. So the decorated style is, is probably their high point of creativity and inventiveness and uh, uh, occasionally you know you see images which um, not only wouldn't get paying permission today but cause an absolute outrage if you stumbled in them on, on the dark web and there they are um, somebody said yes that's appropriate on a church thank you john and i think we've got time for one more question i quite i think that's a good one to finish on um do you have a favorite medieval parish church for oh, our no. pictures it's a hard one <laughs> to ask i know there's a, there's a crucial quality there, isn't there, for architectural features. Um, I could think of favourite churches for given styles, buildings which are kind of perfect little time machines. Uh, Hillpeck for Romanesque, West Walton in Norfolk for Early English, Eckington or Patrington in Lincolnshire and Yorkshire for Decorated, etc. Long Melford, Lavenham for Perpendicular. Um, actually, Although I go on about cathedrals uh, and talk a lot about great churches academically in, in my writing, uh, buildings that move me, that I love most, are the little unrestored, layered buildings. Um, and there's something there which is, is more than the sum of its parts. Um, uh, and those are my favourite buildings of all. Thank you, John. And everyone, thank you so much for your um, time and tuning in today's lecture. Please do comment away still. Um, we keep an eye on all the comments. So if there's more questions, we'll try and get answers to you. Um, do look on our Facebook page for upcoming events. As I said, we've got um, more um, that we've just released, released today. Um, next week, we'll be joined by um, Dr. Joanna Dale from University College London, who will be talking to us about St. Oswald, his life, and more importantly, or more interestingly, his death and afterlife, and how an obscure Northumbrian king became a major um, cult across Europe. So do join us next Thursday for that lecture. I can pun, it's a disarming story. Uh, <laughs> thanks, John. And um, everyone, as we said at the start of this lecture, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but hopefully you've enjoyed today's lecture. Um, if you have um, and you want to um, support us, please do consider making a donation. You can text CCT to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds. Um, but if you would like to um, learn more about us or actually want to um, get more information about some of our work and be kept updated about conservation work do consider becoming a member um, of the church conservation trust it's just three pounds fifty a month and if you join us by direct debit and if you use the code on our website and we're going to comment a link shortly um, if you use the code lecture you will get a free copy of this wonderful book it's called beautiful churches by matthew byrne um, so as i said if you sign up as a member by direct debit just three pound fifty a month we'll send you a free copy of that book um, that is everything for today, but thank you so much again, John. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you also to everyone who's been commenting with suggestions for future lectures. Um, we really value your suggestions, so do keep commenting. Send us a Facebook message if you've got any particular ideas or anyone you want us to try and get um, to do a lecture for you, and we'll do our best. But um, I think all that remains to be said again is thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all at a future um, lunchtime lecture. Take care. Thank you all for week. listening.